Welcome to the Engage webinar, Improving Faculty-Student Interaction. Today we're going to talk about research-based, time-effective tips to engage students. Um, just a little bit about the Engage program, which is an NSF-funded program. Um, the overarching goal of Engage is to increase the capacity of engineering schools to retain undergraduate students, first and year students by facilitating the implementation of research-based strategies to improve the educational experience. And there are three strategies that Engage works with schools on. The first is assessing students' spatial visualization skills for freshmen, and then providing curriculum to improve the skills of students who fall below a certain threshold. The second strategy is encouraging faculty to use and develop examples that are familiar and relevant to students to teach technical concepts in engineering, math, and science, or everyday examples in engineering. And then the third strategy is the topic of today's webinar, enhancing the ability for faculty and students to interact in and out of the classroom. So now I want to introduce the people who you're seeing on your webcam videos. Um, our first speaker is Becky Whiting Packard. She's a professor of educational psychology at Mount Holyoke College. She's also the director of the Weissman Center for Leadership and the Liberal Arts. And she's also the associate dean of faculty with responsibility for teaching and faculty development initiatives. Dr. Packard's recent research focuses on the experiences of first-generation college women as they navigate the community college transfer pathway in STEM fields. Becky's published numerous articles on mentoring and persistence in science fields, as well as the career development of racially diverse individuals from lower-income backgrounds. And she's a recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award. I'm seeing a Becky earned her Ph.D. from Michigan State University and her B.A. from the University of Michigan. So as a professor at Mount Holyoke, she comes to us with experience in both large and small school environments. So Becky, I'm going to hand the microphone to you to introduce Krishna. Great. Well, I'm so glad to be with everyone here today, even though um, I think you can see me. I can't see you. But thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to be part of this, and I've been involved in the Engage project now for multiple years, and actually just returned from a few days at the National Academy of Engineering, where we were focusing on diversity in engineering, actually with a number of scholars in the field, but also deans of colleges of engineering and um, faculty in those programs to really ask similar questions as to what we're going to be talking about today. So glad to be joined by Krishna. Pakala, Clinical Assistant Professor of Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering at Boise State University. And Krishna, if, um, if we can get him unmuted, yep. I'd like him to just uh, chime in on his involvement in the program. Hello, everyone. Uh, I uh, am associated with Engage for the past one year. And I think if somebody asked me what is one success for any faculty, uh, what is the secret? Uh, I think it's the faculty-student interaction and uh, I, I can see a huge uh, success with that and I'm willing to share that with you guys today. That's great. Okay, so today we're going to talk a lot about faculty-student interaction and we know that faculty interact with students on a daily basis but I would say many of us are running around so much we rarely stop to think about all of the different ways we interact, whether it's in the hallway, whether we're in class, whether it's after um, class in office hours, and working on our research, or when we're writing comments to students, either on projects or in an online um, course management system. These are all of the ways that we interact with students. And what we know is that interacting with students makes a big difference in student engagement and also their longer-term retention in the field. And so this quotation from Dr. Norman Fortenberry, the executive director of ASWE, really speaks volumes to this issue, and, and you can read it there, that research literature demonstrates that faculty-student interactions, both in terms of quality and quantity, influence student engagement, confidence, learning, and retention. And what I really want to underscore is that this research literature is incredibly robust. So we have decades of research 
um, the purpose of this talk or this webinar is to really focus on some concrete, specific changes that faculty can engage in that really make a big difference for students. Um, just going further on the next slide, whether it's a research, there are many research studies that have been published in science, produced for the National Science Foundation, or ASWE, that have all found similar results that when students interact with their professors and come away with a positive result, they're more likely to prog progress in the field and persist in the field. And what we know is that interactions with faculty have um, an especially big influence on female students and on racial ethnic minority students. Um, unfortunately, going to the next slide, uh, we know that the, one of the biggest barriers is time. And um, each of the webinars that we run and actually each of the campuses that I visited through Engage, we hear time and time again that um, faculty are either teaching many classes or they're stretched for time because they have other ways that they're being evaluated or other priorities. And so um, even if it's not a matter of, of caring more about spending the time, so that the time may not be there. And so the good news is this, that even small, casual interactions that are very small on time actually can have a very big impact for students. And this quotation on this slide, I just want to take a minute to read it. Um, I was just about to change my major. I was getting overwhelmed. My professor talked to me and reminded me of the opportunities available to me in the field. I stuck with it, and I'm glad I did. What we hear more and more from students in the research is not necessarily a big intensive relationship. It was often a casual offhand comment from a faculty member to a student that actually made the difference in why they decided to stay with the field. And the thing that I think faculty maybe underestimate the value of those small comments or those little interactions that um, the students are trying to decide whether they should persist in the field, whether this is the right fit for them. And so hearing a comment from a professor who is actually viewed as a very credible source, that can make the big difference um, for students. And a study of nine schools of engineering found that positive faculty-student interactions were significantly related to student satisfaction and their intention of being employed in the engineering field 10 years into the future. So it really makes a huge difference for students. And I think that's what our focus is going to be. What are some of those low on time but big impact for students? What are some of those actions that, that have that impact? And before I go on, I want to just underscore the positive benefit for faculty. I think that, um, and this is the next, yeah, this is the, the correct slide. I think that there's a lot of emphasis. I'm a professor as well, and um, an associate dean, and so faculty do ask me, you know, what's in it for me? I mean, not that we don't care about students, but certainly you want to know that there's a benefit to you. And so what we know is that when students feel they can uh, interact with their faculty, when they feel they can approach faculty and ask questions, they're more apt to be engaged in the material. They um, they work harder on their, their work. They are more, they they produce higher quality office hours and, and better quality work. And so I think for faculty, that's incredibly motivating um, when they feel that students are getting it, when students are engaged, and that there's a high quality of engagement and learning. What we also know is that these time effective techniques that we're going to be reviewing in this webinar, they are reflected in positive student course evaluations. Now before um, people give me the critical eye, about course evaluations, I'm not talking about a popularity contest or that people said, oh, I loved this class because it was easy. In a study of 800 college courses, which included a large subset of engineering classrooms, we learned that faculty evaluations were actually not associated with workload being easy or being hard. Instead, it was more positive evaluations were associated with a sense of positive, a positive learning environment for students. So when students found faculty to be approachable and to be sensitive to the needs of the students in terms of their learning, they were more apt to find that, that class, to rate that class as, as more positive. And so I guess what I wanted to say was that um, 
you don't have to sacrifice the rigor of your class for students to come away feeling that you cared about their learning and that the process of learning was fair. Okay, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight four themes from the research, break those down into some um, types of time-effective strategies, and we're going to hear from Krishna on each of them in terms of how, what he actually does in the classroom to see if that sparks um, some of the questions at the end. And so the first finding is that faculty approachability really matters. And so we know that, um, as I stated before, that when faculty are perceived as being approachable, students are more apt to ask questions. And what we know in the literature is that when students ask questions, they tend to feel actually more capable and come away with a higher sense of self-efficacy, which is the confidence in their ability to achieve or learn in a setting. And so when students don't have the chance to ask questions, that feeling of confidence or capability is often hindered. Um, and so faculty who are viewed as open or responsive to questions, that is associated with better, better learning outcomes for students. And what we know is that for women in particular, um, they're more apt to report, report that approachability is very important for them in terms of the learning environment. And so how does a faculty member improve their approachability? We have a slide there. Um, you can see the picture of sort of Mr. Approachability in the middle. And, and not everybody feels like they can either share something from their own life, a hobby, or something that makes them you know, more into a relatable person. Um, I know sometimes just sharing a paper that you're reading or a conference you just returned from it, it helps the, the student to see that you're a real person that's very active in the field. And so sometimes it can just be um, taking that moment to share that, that bit of activity with the student. A very specific way that a faculty member can improve approachability is to use student names. And um, this is important for a variety of reasons. I'll just say, notice I said not learn the names because um, sometimes you have courses with very large numbers of students and it can be very difficult even if you learn some of the tricks of the trade of learning names. Um, what we're really recommending is just using student names, whether it's um, on the slide we have, you can print out a photo roster. Most, most um, course management systems actually have this capability. Even if you didn't have that, just being able to signal some of the student names. Remember when Jennifer talked about the bridge that she built in class. Students literally tune in to the use of their own name, you know, like you're playing their favorite song. So I think that there's a sense that, you know, the students are people and that you're using their names. Um, the second strategy we want to recommend is the use of small group office hours. And, you know, students often complain that they find their faculty members to be intimidating. And faculty often complain that they have empty office hours, that students aren't coming. And so um, I think it's the sense that we've, we've heard from faculty that this strategy resonates because they break students into small groups anyway for projects in, in the class. And so asking those small groups to rotate through your office hours so that each small group has met with you, even for a brief period of time, um, it can have many benefits. One, if you hold that small group office hour in a more public space, which can be more comfortable sometimes for the faculty member or for the students, um, there's a chance to make your work more public and more visible to students, and it increases your approachability. The second is that there's a chance for um, faculty to help um, mentor and coach small group team interactions in really effective ways. So um, students get to hear questions asked by their peers. They get to hear you answer those questions. And so it's not reliant on just a one-on-one -on -one interaction. And the, the thing we want to just say here is that now we know with technology, those small group office hours don't have to take place face-to-face -face either. And that for many commuting students and other students, using virtual office hours um, can have the same positive benefit. So Krishna, at this point, I'd love to hear from you on some of the strategies you've used with in terms of using student names or using virtual office hours. 
Yeah, thank you. So I try to uh, incorporate most of the things which uh, Becky said. In addition, I think most popular has been the virtual office hours. Uh, I call them happy hours. Just before an exam day, you know, just to relax them and I kind of give a pre-test and then uh, we have a discussion on how to do that. In addition, I try to think of uh, adapting each semester depending on the crowd I have, especially in thermodynamics, which is the first difficult class with most engineering students take. Uh, I'm finding that the dedication levels is not quite right, so somebody has to stir them up. So for example, after exam one, which was last week, I gave them a handout today with a note to them, and then on the other side, I gave them a list of questions to answer. And I said, if you answered no to many of them, that means you have to come and talk to me. Um, and uh, so this is an, one way to make it easier for them, and then I told told them a story saying there was a student last semester which was true uh, who got a 28 in the exam I had a chat with him and he ended up ace. just making them believe that we are human too can help I think uh, then the approachability would be there and then I think they they can succeed after that That's great thanks over and out <laughs> Yeah, and I think that this, um, for people, I'm, I'm sure there are people who could share during the question and answer your use of Google Hangout or other methods of using virtual office hours that you actually can reach more students in a more just-in-time method. Um, you know, maybe you don't have to offer them at midnight, but certainly, you know, it gives some flexibility for, for reaching students at the time when they're actually working on their work. So the second research finding is that giving effective feedback improves student work. This seems somewhat um, obvious, but what we know is that when students receive feedback on um, both what they're doing well and, and why it's going well, and also very specific ways that they can improve, they come away with a feeling that they're more in control, and when you feel more in control of your learning, you feel more capable and you're more motivated to persist in the face of difficulty. And so what can be difficult is that students often find themselves with just the grade or just the score, and they don't really have a sense of either what contributed to a good grade or what contributed to um, basically missing the point or missing a, a key component. And I think the barrier for faculty here is that providing feedback is very time consuming. And, um, and yet, if you don't provide specific feedback, we also know that faculty can then be inundated with requests for tutoring or individual one-on-one -on -one remediation. So there seems to be also a time lost by not providing the feedback. And so um, it's also unmotivating for the faculty member to have low quality work. And so what we recommend here is to use a grading rubric. Um, many of you may already do this, but um, it, it seems that in our conversations with faculty that these rubrics are not either often used or shared among faculty that people often, you know, feel they have to reinvent the wheel, come up with something on their own when there could be some really um, great progress of sharing these. And it can be just putting the time in up front on this can yield dividends later. It provides a more transparent grading process to students and um, the faculty drive this. So you think of what is a priority for you and really putting it out there to students. If you work with TAs, it's a matter of training or teaching, preparing your TAs to use a rubric effectively. And so one sample rubric we have on the next slide um, just shows three components. It can just be, you know, these are the three things I'm going to be scanning for and how I broke down the points. Um, some people don't use points. They only use the components and then give an overall score. And so it can just be a matter of crossing out one of the components that it was absent and you've decided to subtract a certain number of points. So people are different about how detailed they want the rubric to be. I think it's, it's really from the student perspective being able to see those priorities laid out so that when they then try to assess their own work before turning it in, they have a sense of what they're looking for and, and how they can give themselves a check on the work. And um, so for this student having some kind of computation errors and also they didn't give enough examples, that just clues the student in and it makes it more clear where, where they missed the point. Another um, specific tip is to get um, more questions from students when there's limited time. And so 
you often have a lot of hands go up or maybe only the really um, outgoing students raise their hand and ask questions and then other students leave and you're not really sure if they understood what was going on. Um, one thing that can help is having students at the very end of class just jot down questions that they have and turn those in to either you or to a teaching assistant who can then just scan through really quickly and see what are some of the common themes or common questions that came up. Um, many campuses are using clickers to also do a very quick pulse of um, student questions. And I think this is the way that if you notice that um, you know, half of your class it is really struggling with a particular thread, well then you know in your next class period you could start by addressing that or you could assign some additional homework problems in that area. And that can really tell students that you care about their learning, you didn't, um, you didn't use up any additional class time, it was just a very quick submission and then scan which gave you some additional input. So Krishna, do you want to talk a little bit about your use of rubrics or how you use index cards in a similar manner? Yeah, uh, I, I strongly believe that uh, prompt feedback uh, which, which I used to get and which stu students should also get. Uh, this semester uh, all of them have iPads in my class so I have them create drop boxes and I share their you know graded exams in that sense but I don't recommend that everybody have an iPad and stuff in the class but the way I used to do earlier pre-iPad era was to take their exams, grade them and make sure they have it in the next class period. And then I used to create a video of uh, the common mistakes which I saw in the exams, uh, and then how, how what was the grading rubric I used, and uh, and and then I gave them a week to contest anything. And typically there was only one or two at, out of class of 80, so that, that told me that this thing works. And you know I had less questions. Nobody has any problems with that. The other thing in terms of uh, getting feedback from them you know with all the technology I still think uh, index card like this would work where uh, on one side of the card I you know I, I have them write what is going good for the class especially in the first few weeks and then on the other side if at all there is anything which is hindering their learning progress I said I value that and just write it on there since it is anonymous uh, you know I, I could see that there are people who write and then I do it for the first few weeks and then later on automatically since I take care of those I don't see anybody writing anything so that's when I I know that my my class is on my side so now I can make them work harder mm -hmm. uh, but it, it totally works and uh, you know when when I ask a question in the class where I say anyone in the class I don't get any response but then when I have them write on this I get maybe 70% mm -hmm. of the class answering so there is benefit to this that's great thank you Okay, so we're going to go to the next research finding, which is that faculty expectations influence student performance. And what we know is when we look at the research from the time a student is in kindergarten and in first grade, they are well tuned into what their teachers expect from them. And the saying goes that students will float to the mark set. And so um, this just builds on what Krishna said, that students will work harder and persist if they believe the professor believes in them and their capabilities. And so this takes the, the research on faculty feedback and just takes it one step further. And so um, when students get the feedback or they get the lower mark, they may come away wondering, you know, is, this, is it even possible to improve? And, um, you know, am I suited for this field? And students have different thresholds for what um, the signs are that they should or should not continue in the field. And um, it can really help when the faculty member encourages students to persist. It just seems maybe obvious, um, but we, we're not saying, you know, don't be candid with a student when they've missed the mark. You do need to be candid. If this work is not high quality, you've missed several points. But that being able to say, but I really want to encourage you to stick with it. Try these strategies. Try to work in your teams. Try to go work on these things. And that I feel confident if you do those things that you will improve the quality of your work. And so I have a few of the quotations on the next page. And I think this is a really important point because I think a lot of faculty think that they can tell and they can know 
if a student is going to make it. But I think what we find in engineering is we don't always know we don't always know who's going to do well and that some students surprise us. And I think it's trying to hold out for some of that surprise, encouraging the persistence. So faculty think they're helpful if they say, if you can't do really well with this simple concept, you are in trouble. You could say, this is a foundational concept you need to understand. Here are some ways you can work on it. Or, listen, I'm trying to do you a favor. Get out now before investing any further. You could say, I applaud your commitment to becoming an engineer. Um, this is what it takes to be successful. And I can see that calculus here is really tripping you up. And so I encourage you to sign up for tutoring. Now, you can't control if the student's going to listen to that suggestion. But um, I would just encourage you to take that step to make that comment to the student. Um, because it really can make a big difference. And as I said, students can surprise us. On the next slide, I have just an example of sending a constructive email to students. Um, as I said, if you did the index card method or some other method of scanning for student questions, you can then send a note. I noticed from the grading that many people skipped one critical step. I'm posting a link to a website that might be helpful, so take a look before Wednesday. Keep working at it. So just being able to add that additional comment, um, I think some people say, well, you know, if you really want it and you really want to stay in the field, you know, you just know that and you'll keep working. I think we find more and more that um, students are looking to us as faculty for that additional encouragement to stay with it, and it can make, it can make a big difference. Um, so, Krishna, did you have more that you wanted to add about this part, about the encouraging message? Yeah, I think... Uh... Yeah, I think making students believe uh, about their uh, what they can do in life is is one a good start. You know, there was a student who said to me that he had to repeat this particular class twice, and then he met me the other day, and then he eventually passed that class, and then he's taking another class with me. I said, uh, you know, I can guarantee you that you'll not fail any class from now on. Uh, what makes me say that? I asked him. He, he told me that he he started working harder and he believed he started believing himself so that's a, that's a great story and then in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, giving messages to students where you see a potential learning problem I think that's a great teaching moment and I take that opportunity to say okay you didn't get this problem which is a prerequisite you should know partial derivatives but I'm gonna teach you at least now and then I'm gonna give you more problems on it that that's how I operate in, mm -hmm. in these classes and that makes them believe that they can do it and you know at least they, they know they got that which is something which they should have learned earlier that's great Okay, so we're moving into actually the fourth and final research finding. And so, so far we've talked about using student names, leveraging office hours by having small groups rotate through or using virtual small group office hours, using a grading rubric or having students write down questions and then scanning them for some themes, including a constructive message with some strategies that students could um, try and reminding them, you know, where these sticking points are and that encouraging them to stick with it. This fourth and final research finding is that linking academics to future careers motivates students. And in that same time-sensitive strategy or time-effective um, teaching tip, what we're recommending here is you can start class with a one-minute message or you can end class with a one-minute message that helps to link um, the academic content in the class to the future engineering career. Many of us can't afford to take an entire class period to go either on a field trip, to have a guest speaker, um, that, that we can't do that all the time or even every week or even every month, that that's not really, um, we need every class um, period that we have for the content that we want to teach or the process that we want to engage in. And so, um, these one-minute messages can be quite powerful. They don't take up a lot of time, but they help students to, again, really tune in to the, to the lecture or to the, the unit at hand. So on the slide, you can see a few examples. Um, volunteering a couple hours a week on research can be a great thing to do. I just learned Professor Brown is looking for help, so stop by his or her office hours to learn more. 
Um, Jessica, one of my former students now works for the EPA, and she says she learns what she did in this class um, or in this particular unit on a regular basis. And then, um, you know, sometimes professors, they, you know, the, in the news, this kind of, you know, everybody brings something in, and I'll just take a minute of class to say, how is what we're learning linked to the world news? Um, there are lots of ways to do this. Again, um, especially in introductory classes, students feel like they're waiting an awful long time to figure out how what they're learning might relate to something in the future. One thing that um, the University of Texas at Austin, what they have done with this is actually, the, um, rather than doing the one-minute message or in addition to doing one-minute messages, they actually do take a portion of a class. They call it cookies in the classroom. That's because students get cookies. Um, and the professor engages in about a 20-minute um, opportunity to talk with the students about their own trajectory or something um, in the field to kind of get to know the professor a little bit better. Using this approach, they have reached over 2,000 students in 44 classes in eight majors. And I'm going to present to you a couple um, findings based on surveys with 400 of those students that reveal many positive outcomes. But essentially, a cookies in the classroom a connection class is um, about 20 minutes in one class period in a first or second year engineering course. And so this is what they found from doing this approach. Again, just about 20 minutes of, the, of one class period. On the next slide, 97% said they learned something new from their instructor, and 94% said there was some value in having this class. Um, an example of what a student said on the next slide, I think it made the professor more approachable. Honestly, it might make going into office hours a lot less in intimidating. And our favorite quote, freaking awesome. Um, so students really loved this. And when we talk to the professors about the connections class, um, half of the professors said it increased their sense of accessibility to students, that they too felt a real shift um, after spending that time. And um, almost 40% said it improved their relationship with students. And so we, we actually do have a couple minutes um, before we go to question and answer. Krishna, if there's anything you wanted to add here about the one-minute message or this idea of a connections class that, in this case, it was a professor talking about his or her trajectory, but it could be the professor talking about their own research in the field or a conference they just returned from or, you know, just something about how they got into the field. And students really, um, just like I said, in, at the Texas at Austin has been an amazing program, but certainly the one-minute messages we've also heard really great feedback on. Yeah, uh, so this semester I started doing this uh, because I, I felt there were more and more who were not coming with the right attitude into engineering. So I said, let me do a motivational based on my life experiences. So I call it like secrets of success in engineering. And then I had like a 30 minute talk about, I did a couple of polls, you know, why they want to be an engineer. And then, uh, you know, what do they think as a success strategies. Uh, and then they came up with list of stuff. And then I weaved around the presentation on that. And I gave them some helpful hints. And then some of them at the end said, you know, it was useful. Maybe some think it was a place, you know, waste of class time. But then I said it was really important. And then, uh, you know, I try to do lots of uh, relative, uh, relatability to the future careers and also why they are taking this class. So I, and nowadays I'm putting a slide in my classes saying, all your majors who are taking this class, these are the jobs you can get. Uh, you know, for electrical, mechanical, civil, environmental, these are the different jobs and this is how you're going to use thermodynamics in these jobs. Uh, it is inevitable that you have to, you're going to use it. And then also I tell a couple of student stories who work in internships where they say they're glad they took thermo because that, that helped them understand how the, these HVAC uh, boilers and how they operate. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so just reiterating that uh, in also in exams I try to make it uh, such that they're framed in everyday sentences where they see that one I pick one of them 
one of those students names and say Andrew got a job in this power plant and he wants to do this and that kind of breaks the tension in an exam and then they finally know that okay this is how the problems are in the real world and they use what they learned in the class. So those are some of the things I right. try to do. Great and Jane I think we're ready now. Um, people either have comments or questions about any of the specific strategies or certainly if people at either campus want to share something that we did not mention, um, you know, either something that resonated for them or something that they've been doing that they want to let the rest of the group know or if there's a question they have for either of us, they should feel free to ask those or, or type those in. Yeah, I just sent in the question. This is Patrick Avalencia from Manhattan College. Hi. Okay, I'll be Hi, how are you doing? Pretty good. How are you doing? Yeah, guys. Uh, excellent webinar. Thanks for taking time for us. Um, I was wondering um, if you both find yourselves, when you're running the Connections class, do you guys mostly do the talking, or is it really a two-way dialogue between you and the students and you getting to know who they are? That's a really good question, and my sense, at, at least at Texas, is that um, it it's interesting because it's only 20 minutes, so in that 20 minutes, it seems that for the most part, it is the professor talking and sharing, and the, question, the students are definitely generating, you know, questions and asking. Um, it sounds like it's more in the class sessions that follow, the students would be more apt to come up during office hours or stop by after class and say, hey, I'm actually interested in an internship in X or hey, you know, um, I've been thinking, you know, about this question or topic and then kind of, you know, introducing themselves more sort of in the, in the class sessions that follow versus in that exact, you know, time slot. Krishna, did you want to? Yeah, the way I do it is I don't do this connections class for my class. I actually, we have the Engineering 120, the introductory introduction to engineering course, do it. But then me and my colleague who is the co-PI of this, we go into the class and uh, for those 20 minutes we make it as interactive, as lively as possible. Uh, typically, you know, we, we take iPads into the classroom and do it or, you know, most of them have these web-enabled devices and stuff. So we just use that. We say this is your chance to use them if you want to right now. So we just make it interactive. We ask them questions and we get get a you know one on one like that and uh, you know we, we make it fun we put like word clouds of their opinions and all that some of them would have never seen it so just to break it up from the monotonous uh, sage on the stage so we we involve them a lot krishna i have a question from lakeisha mississippi the index card idea is neat can you explain it again Okay, uh, so the way it goes is, let's say the first week of the class, you set the ground rules and stuff. So you want to know how, how things are going. So the way I tell my students is, the final evaluations which most of us get is, is useless for this current class if, uh, if that is done at the end of the semester. Yes. So what I tell them is, uh, make sure you write anything you feel like on either side, on one side of the card and uh, you know what is good what is you know what is working really well and on the other side you know write what is not working great you know and you can frame the questions the way you want but i try to keep it simple and uh, you know i make it anonymous but there are people who still write their names they think it is for credit and sometimes <laughs> i say in life uh, to 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 learn there is no credit <laughs> you know there is no grade but <laughs> there is no assessment you just learn so I, I think this this is something which uh, which they like and in fact I have I've had people say that it, it please do more of these because it feels that you're making us part of the class and you're you're mm -hmm. tailoring your class to our needs and I think the more flexible we are uh, it helps them Krishna do you acknowledge people's uh, ideas that come to you on the index cards in your classroom do you say I'm changing this because I heard something yeah, uh, like for a s simple example, when I started this, there's one day where it was pretty cold uh, and, uh, you know, I think lots of schools close, got uh, closed down. That's when I was doing the temperature and pressure introduction in Thermo. 
Uh, so I asked them to turn on their cell phones and uh, find out the temperature and ask them to convert into several different scales. And then they had to write that on, the, on one side of the card, the other side they write what is going well with the class and all that. <laughs> so I looked at the answers and then I liked one answer when this guy said the temperature in Boise is so and so. I think this is a comfortable temperature because the human body is so and so. I mean, he explained just a, a number with a lot of details. So I kind of told the, the class, I asked who it was, if, if I could share their name. And this guy showed up, uh, raised his hand, and I said, that's a great thought process. You know, you have to disseminate information like this. Numbers don't mean anything. If you say 10, I mean, I'm like, is it 10 oranges or apples? I mean, is it temperature or pressure? <laughs> so, so I think that really got on to him and he did well in the class and also others who were like ready to try to b better him. Great, thank you. Yeah, Jane, just to pick up on that thread though, certainly when you, if you were to read out, you know, 10 people or even if you don't say the number, a number of people said they were stuck on this and so I'm going to start just by going over that again. Those people in the class where if they had raised their hand or if they left the class feeling they were the only one it's often the sense of I was the only one, but then later you go, oh yeah, a lot of people get stuck here. And if, if you didn't do this technique of either the index card or writing it down, many students just leave thinking they're the only ones. And that can be the really demotivating factor that means that they, you know, think they're not cut out for something where in fact it's really tricky. You know, that particular concept was very difficult and a lot of people struggled with it, but it doesn't mean that you won't get through it. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Manhattan. Do the students know that the Connections class is coming? In other words, do you announce this ahead of time, or do they come in surprise to a classroom with free breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> I think you could do it any way that you want. I think they do know, and the students really turn out in droves. They, um, in Texas, they have a very active um, women in engineering and minority in engineering program as well. So they're co doing this collaboratively with those offices um, in terms of who who shows up with the cookies and, and kind of um, doing it jointly. So every campus is a bit different in terms of how they want to do it, whether it's a surprise. I could imagine a situation where a student would be very disappointed that they had missed or come in late on a class where that was happening, but I'm sure it could be embedded anywhere. Um, you know, either explicitly or not. Great, thank you. Any more questions? I, do, I wanted to raise one more thing if there's... Sure, go if, ahead. If you do, I don't know if anyone's typing anything. Um, I just see a thank you from uh, Goldie. Um, I'm going to unmute Lakeisha. And Lakeisha, I'm just going to see if you guys have any more questions. Um, no, I guess I can ask about the connections class. I was as as Becky was talking, I had a quick uh, question. So, are they more effective? I guess ha has 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 any research been done on the effectiveness of the connections class, whether it's in the classroom mm -hmm. setting with the faculty, or whether it's you know in the department setting with all the faculty and all the students are invited or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that in terms of all of that, the the 400 students and then the um, I guess the dozen faculty mm -hmm. that they had surveys from, mm -hmm. um, that their their sense was, and these are all faculty who've done either you know obviously they taught for many years or in many semesters without using the connections class, mm -hmm. and then no and had a noticeable change in terms of their own perception and the students' ratings of feeling connected to that professor. Now the question is, feeling connected, if that then leads to feeling more approachable, asking more questions, um, we don't necessarily have at our fingertips that then those students outperformed, you know, the previous um, semester students. But the professor's ratings and the students' ratings indicated that students definitely came away and the faculty came away feeling that the, um, they were more approachable, more accessible, and therefore higher quality learning had occurred. Um, since it's, it just has been happening in the last couple of years, it's, it's probably a little bit early to say then, as maybe what you're, you're asking is, is there an out, a direct outcome? And I guess we would be surprised if 20 minutes would have that kind of, that big of an outcome, mm -hmm. but certainly it shows 
how even just that small bit, if it changes the climate, right. you know, then that's a powerful statement. And I think that um, what we're finding across these many campuses, which now have been, I think, over 60 campuses have participated in some way, um, the more you can make it time effective, the more likely it is the faculty will try it because mm -hmm. Um, it's really hard to tell people to do something or try something that's going to take over, you know, a whole class period or fundamentally alter how people are going to teach. I think that's the bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm going to open up uh, Manhattan's line. Goli, does anyone in your room have any more questions? I think that's all we have. Uh, this is Patrick again. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to take one minute to show you how to find more resources from the Engage project. We do have a public website, 100% open access to anyone. The URL is engageengineering.org, and you can find information about all three strategies on the website. I've just circled um, the information about uh, the strategy we're talking about today, faculty-student interaction, and it will take you to a web page that has research, resources, and tips as well as FAQs. And I know that there are some folks who haven't been able to attend this webinar, so we have been recording it, and I'll edit out some of the junk and send the links off to Goli and Lakeisha to share with you. And they already have the PowerPoint presentations. Uh, we encourage you to share um, widely with your colleagues. And uh, in the back of the presentation, we also do have all of the different references in case you're so inclined to um, look at some of the research body on this topic. If there are no other questions from folks, I'm going to just say thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate your showing up, listening, and answer asking some great questions. And thank you to Becky and Krishna. It's always fun every time I listen to you. It makes me want to be a student again. Thank you, everyone.